All right then, so today I'm going to tell you about uh, deep kernel processes, but more importantly, the sort of process by which we got there. So in particular, um, there's these two models that are now very big and popular and that we all care about. These are neural networks and Gaussian processes. And they really have almost completely different um, advantages. So in particular, neural networks down here perform really well at um, getting the problems on tasks such as those classifications area. I think it's fair to say that Gaussian processes are still less effective than neural networks on these types of tasks. But at the same time, um, we don't just want necessarily state-of-the-art performance. We also want accurate uncertainty estimation, especially as these models are starting to be put into safety critical settings such as self-driving cars. And now it's the opposite way around. So Gaussian processes have excellent uncertainty estimation. That's kind of the whole point. And often this uncertainty estimation is in closed form, so it's highly accurate. In contrast, neural networks don't have this really effective uncertainty estimation. And while you know, some people have, uh, there's lots of work on getting uncertainty estimation in neural networks, I think it's fair to say that the resulting uncertainty estimates are less reliable than those in Gaussian processes. So then the big picture question that we were asking in this series of work amongst other work that I do is can we combine the advantages of Gaussian processes and neural networks? So can we get a sort of unified method that is able to get really good performance on something like image classification and at the same time, really accurate uncertainty estimation? Okay. And so to get there, I'm going to take you sort of very briefly through three papers. So in the first paper, which I've somewhat distressingly titled A New Hope here, we see that infinitely wide neural networks, so the output of them becomes Gaussian process distributed. And now potentially this is really, really nice because it means that we can perform exact inference in state-of-the-art networks that look like ResNet, the only difference is that they're infinitely wide or they've got infinitely many channels if it's a convolutional network, as opposed to the standard setting where they're finitely wide. So this was really exciting and we thought, wow, we're immediately gonna get amazing performance with this. It turns out that we didn't. So actually the performance of these, these methods, which are also known as neural network Gaussian processes or NNGPs, so the performance was very poor. And as I'm going to describe in this part of the talk, the issue is that they lack representation learning. And we know that learning the top layer representation is sort of what deep neural networks do, and it's why we get all the amazing performance benefits that we do in a deep neural network. So that kind of motivated us to take a step back and think about, well, how can I get something that looks like one of these infinite neural networks, but has some representation learning in it? And that was this deep kernel process. And so the key things here is that, again, it combines this uh, infinite neural network like architecture with flexible representation learning. So unlike a deep Gaussian process, it works entirely in the kernel domain. So there's no intermediate layer features in there. Potentially, it's even got unimodal true posteriors, which means it should be relatively easy to approximate. And a bunch of models that we care about, things like neural networks, neural network Gaussian processes, sorry, and deep Gaussian processes, are all actually special cases of deep kernel processes. So, you know, it really captures a large number of models um, that are practically very relevant. And we just got the reviews back from, or the, the decision back from ICML, and actually this is being published in ICML this year. All right. So then, the first paper, A New Hope, uh, Infinite Neural Networks as Gaussian Processes. And so in outline here, I'm actually going to, instead of taking you through this one paper, which is fairly specific, and it's about uh, convolutional networks, which tends to get quite complicated, I'm really going to use this as a jumping off point to go through a little bit of the background behind this infinite network literature. So in particular, in this literature, we're sort of identifying Gaussian processes with neural networks in a variety of increasingly complicated settings. 
So I'm going to start by talking about a zero hidden layer network, which is really just Bayesian linear regression, and then an infinite one hidden layer network, uh, which is something Radford Neal considered back in 1985, getting towards 30 years ago now. And then an infinite deep network, uh, which was developed by others um, around 2018 or so. And then looking at a convolutional architecture such as resonance, which I was involved in. Okay, so then if we take this zero hidden layer case, which is equivalent, as I said, to Bayesian linear regression, um, we have a network that looks something like this. So we have a batch of input vectors here, uh, x, and then we're going to get a batch of scalar outputs here, which is a vector y, which is given by multiplying x here, so that big batch, by w. And then we can set a prior on this weight vector down here. We're normalizing here by the number of inputs. Um, and if I combine this batch of input vectors with yeah, batch of input vectors with this prior on the weights, I can actually equivalently get a prior on the outputs here. And this is the sort of classical relationship between a Gaussian process and Bayesian linear regression. And if you look into this in a bit more depth, you can see that the covariance is XX transposed. And so what this is saying is that if I have similar inputs uh, or similar Xs, then the Ys are going to be correlated, the Ys are going to be similar. And so that sort of defines our Gaussian process in this space. And there's another potentially quite important consequence, which we're going to use several times in the future, is that to make predictions or about what this Y is going to be, we don't actually need this full batch of input vectors here, X. All we actually need is the kernel, which is this training example by training example matrix given by taking the product of x with itself. Okay then, so what about in a more complicated case, such as now a one hidden layer network where I take the width to infinity? So again, I've got a batch of input vectors x coming in, and then I've got an infinite now hidden layer, uh, which is obtained by multiplying x by a weight matrix now, and applying a pointwise nonlinearity such as a ReLU. And then I'm obtaining a single scalar output for each input point uh, by multiplying that big batch of hidden unit activations by a weight vector W. Okay. And then I'm doing a similar sort of prior over the weights as, I, as we did previously. So one thing we can get from the actually the previous slide um, is that the distribution over the y's now is given by a kernel, um, where this kernel here is HH transposed. So this is exactly the same result that we saw on the previous slide, where I take these H's now uh, to be the inputs on the previous slide. But okay, so that's, that's great, but how you Useful actually is this on the basis that, well, we know that H is these intermediate layer activations and they're going to change because we've got a distribution over this W matrix here. Well, the answer is that actually in the infinite limit, this kernel doesn't vary uh, with the weights down here. It's actually constant. And that's because I can write the kernel like this, which is equivalent to this. And now, if I look at this term in here, this is an image of infinitely many terms, uh, n1 here is being taken to infinity. And then in here, we've got the activation or of h lambda. So this is a vector containing the activation of this hidden unit for all of the examples. And because the weights in here are all iid, and because all of these hidden units depend on the same set of inputs, then all of these terms down here for each individual unit, they're all IID. And so now I've got the average of infinitely many IID terms. And that, by the law of large numbers, is going to become equal to its expectation. And it turns out, in actual fact, that this is something, so I've left it quite abstract, but you can actually compute this in closed form relatively easily using results from um, Chonsol 2009. 
And there's a sort of slightly complicated equation which has like signs in it and causes and stuff. But fundamentally, it's something that's reasonably simple that you can evaluate, that you can put in the inner loop of a, um, of a deep learning system. And it's all, all uh, fast enough uh, to work in this deep learning style set. OK. But what about a deep network where we have multiple layers now whose width is going to infinity? And so in the feature domain, I'm going to write this out in a little bit more depth now or separating things out. So we've got input vectors. Then I'm going to get some Fs here by multiplying the inputs by a weight matrix. And then I'm going to get some Hs by applying the pointwise nonlinearity. Then I'm going to do the same thing at the next layer, Fs by applying a matrix, H by applying a pointwise nonlinearity, and then the y's as usual are given by the h's times a weight vector. So then I can sort of go through a similar process or an analogous process in the kernel domain. So in particular, we start with a kernel, we start by defining a kernel for the inputs by taking the outer product of these inputs with themselves. And then we can compute um, this outer product of the Fs. So I'm going to define this to be G, which is a gram matrix. And in this particular case, where I've got an infinitely wide network and where these connections are all fully connected, then this gram matrix is actually going to be equal um, to this kernel, uh, this input kernel down here. And then I would be interested in the outer product of the Hs. But the H's have had this uh, pointwise nonlinearity applied. So this is actually uh, somewhat more complicated. And to represent that, I've got a sort of arbitrary, or not arbitrary, but a nonlinear function K applied to the gram matrix from the previous layer. So again, this is this thing that we can get read about from Cho and Saul, which involves signs and causes and stuff, which is kind of complicated, but certainly possible to evaluate um, inside a deep learning system. And then we do the same thing again. So we're interested in the gram matrix formed by the product of the Fs, and that's going to be equal to K, again, just in this setting. And then to get the kernel, i.e. the product of the Hs, then we're going to apply uh, this function to the gram matrix from the previous layer. And then finally, this kernel is going to, which is now sort of representing this top layer represent because it's the out of the H's. This is again a training example by training example matrix describing how similar the network judges each in each training example to be. So that top layer representation is going to become equal to our Gaussian process curve. Okay. And then again, it turns out that we can do something very similar in state-of-the-art architectures that are convolutional such as ResNets. But uh, perhaps you're glad, well, certainly I'm glad the indexes and things that you need to do this turn out to be really quite complicated and painful. So I'm not going to go through them in depth. Um, instead, I'm just going to give you an overview of some of the, the papers leading up to these results. So the one hidden layer case was discussed by Radford Neal uh, all the way back in 96. The fully connected case uh, was discussed by these guys. Uh, these ones are from Cambridge, uh, but don't include me. And then the convolutional case was discussed again in these two papers. Again, there's a paper from Cambridge in here, which actually has a disjoint group of authors from this one. Um, and there's papers from Google Brain as well, uh, sort of in parallel in both of those cases. And so these days, there have now been many, many more papers on this basic idea of taking the limit uh, of infinite width and then asking about the uh, analogous Gaussian process kernel and showing that the outputs converge to a Gaussian process, which can if you're a mathematician, be somewhat non-trivial. OK. So that means, sort of a, at a high level, that we have got exact inference in these state-of-the-art architectures that are now convolutional, such as ResNets. And that means, you know, fingers crossed, we should be able to get excellent performance with amazing uncertainty estimates uh, without doing too much more thing. Thank you. So are we done? Is my presentation over? And sadly, the answer is no. And the reason is that the practical performance of these things is really bad. 
Um, so this is now a figure from one of the Google Brain papers. So here they're comparing a neural network Gaussian process, i.e. one of the infinitely wide networks, with a standard neural network trained using reasonably well-tuned uh, stochastic gradient descent. Um, and they're trying just two slightly different architectures here. But actually, the performance of now the neural network Gaussian process is atrocious. So this is CIFAR 10, and we are talking 63% on CIFAR 10, which is remarkably dreadful. Like you're doing something, if you're getting 90%, it's okay, but not amazing. So 63% really is what on earth is going on level bad. So, you know, what on earth is going on? We have uh, exact inference in a state-of-the-art architecture, why are we not getting amazing performance? And the reasoning is that, well, the whole point of deep neural networks is to learn these amazing top layer representations that somehow nicely separate object classes. But we're gonna see that actually the top layer representation for an infinite neural network is fixed. And so there's no possibility of doing any representation learning at all. Um, okay, and then I'm going to show you some theoretical results on deep linear networks to show you actually to get some flavor, some intuition for how learning occurs or taking a kernel view on how learning occurs in a finite neural network. And then I'm going to a real neural network, sort of a large ResNet, and ask whether its actual top layer representation is closer um, to an infinite neural network or to these results suggested by the deep linear network. And it's gonna turn out that it's not very similar to an infinite neural network. That's a bit of a spoiler. Okay then. So to really drill down into this notion of the there being no representation learning, I'm gonna go back to this uh, multi-layer infinitely wide network, and I'm gonna remind us of what happened in the kernel domain. So in particular, we started off by computing this input kernel as the outer product of the x's. This is a deterministic transformation. Okay. And then I'm going to compute the outer product here of the f's. This is before the nonlinearity, and this is again deterministic. Then I'm going to compute the outer product of the h's. Um, so that's going to be this k applied to g. And this k here is a deterministic function. It's computing the expectations. So again, there's no flexibility in here. This is a deterministic transformation. And then again, I'll compute the outer product of the f's. That's a deterministic transformation of what came before. I'm going to compute the outer product of the h's. That's again deterministic. And so that means that the computation, sort of everything, that leads up to the computation of this uh, top layer representation is deterministic. And that means there's no possibility of learning that uh, equivalently top layer representation or Gaussian process kernel. And certainly that was our hypothesis as to why performance was breaking down so spectacularly in these infinite neural network settings. Okay. Yeah, whereas of course, in a deep neural network, the whole point of the exercise is to learn a good top layer representation. And we generally believe that's why they have such good performance. Okay, so to get a little bit more intuition about what's going on here, we can consider um, a toy example of a one hidden layer neural network. So here we've got a batch of input vectors. We've got a linear hidden layer here. So just keeping things as simple as possible which is the inputs multiplied by some weights. And then we've got a single scalar output as usual. And sort of again, as, as we've seen before, we can compute the kernel for the top layer, for the top layer as the outer product of the H's. And that kernel is gonna give us the covariance for the Y's. So now I've done these three equations and I sort of substitute them into each other. And I'm going to get this thing up here. In here, act as kernel hyperparameters. 
as I you remember from a few slides back, as I took this limit of an infinitely wide network, sort of another way to view that result is that this product of the weights becomes equal to the identity. And that's because I'm essentially computing uh, the empirical covariance of the columns of these, these weight matrices from infinitely many samples. So that's going to give me the exact right answer, which is the identity matrix. And if I then use this infinitely wide network, this flexibility that I used to have up here disappears. And I just end up with XX transpose as my kernel. And I'm, I, I no longer have any kernel hyperparameters. I no longer have any flexibility um, in that kernel. And so that means, kind of remarkably, that as we widen the finite neural network, which actually means we're adding more parameters because we're adding more weights here and we're adding more weights here, we can actually decrease flexibility in the underlying model and that can decrease performance. So we always find this a bizarre result. And I think it's a really fundamental one if we want to understand things like how neural networks generalize well despite being massively overparameterized. But for the moment, um, I'm going to look at some uh, simulated and some theoretical results about this flexibility or variability um, in the kernel. So the first way of looking at things is looking, is taking the prior viewpoint and asking about the variability or variance in the, in the top layer kernel, near the diagonal elements of the top layer kernel, as a function now of the width. And we can see very nicely that as the width gets higher, then this variability or variance decreases as we approach this infinite limit. But there's a flip side to this, which is that as networks get deeper, this variability or flexibility increases, and that's because there's more and more opportunities for uh, randomness or stochasticity to build up as we go through the network. Okay, so that's kind of the prior viewpoint, but then often what we'd be interested in is, well, how does this, ex this flexibility express itself during learning? So we were actually able to come up with some analytic results uh, for this setting. And these analytic results are phrased in terms of the input kernel, which we've seen before, um, but also in terms of this output kernel up here. So this is a new quantity. Um, and this is going to be uh, the product of the, it's again, a training example by training example matrix. So it's the sh same shape as this input kernel down here, um, but it's gonna be the product of the outputs. So if I had MNIST or something, uh, this would be the product of the one hot uh, class labels with themselves, which is going to be a rank 10 matrix. And so now we were able to show that the, we were able to give an analytic form, sorry, for the kernels at the intermediate layers after learning. And our interpretation for what was going on here was that these intermediate layer kernels are interpolating from the input kernel to the output kernel here. So if you go in and read this expression uh, somewhat carefully, you can see that ish, what we have down here is two thirds of K naught and one third of K three. And in this one, we've got one third of K naught and two thirds of K three. And in fact, that idea holds for sort of any depth. And the reason that I'm writing this in a slightly funny form is because matrix powers are really nasty complicated things and this is the form that you need uh, to make k1 here positive definite which is entirely non-obvious as you look at it but you can show by doing the computation in python okay but to kind of zoom back out again the key implication is that a representation should be converging towards this output kernel so that gives us a prediction which is that if, as we believe, neural networks are very, very flexible, uh, interesting top layer representation, which is uh, tightly trained to the data, then that top layer representation should resemble this output kernel. And so to test that, uh, we then trained uh, a sort of standard ResNet on CIFAR-10, 
And we looked into depth at that kernel, comparing it to both the output kernel and what you'd expect to get out of an infinite neural network. So then to start with, we looked at the correlation, actually the elements of the covariance matrix, which is a bit of an odd thing to do, but whatever, it's a, a fairly straightforward naive analysis. Um, so this is between the infinite kernel and a trained and untrained uh, finite neural network. And so you can see that the infinite kernel is fairly similar to the untrained network at all layers. And that's because the untrained network is sort of initialized IID from a Gaussian, which is very similar to the assumptions that you make in the infinite network case. But as soon as we start doing any training, we can see that the correlation there between the finite and infinite uh, kernels is massively decreasing. And certainly at that final output layer, which is the one we care about, uh, the, the top layer kernel is almost entirely different um, from what the infinite uh, neural network would suggest. Okay, so that means that, you know, our top layer representation is wholly different from the infinite neural network. Next question is, is it similar to the output kernel? And the answer is yes, although this is a bit less clear. Um, so in particular, the untrained network always has a small correlation with that output kernel, whereas for the trained network, there is a much larger correlation up here, which increases across layers. So this is, again, not quite as strong as some of the results here all the way down to zero, uh, but I think that's actually largely because of this notion that we're comparing correlation coefficients of the elements of the covariance matrix, which is always a bit of an odd thing to do. So to sort of rectify that issue and to think more about the geometry of these kernel matrices, we did something else, which was to look at the spectrum. So in particular, we can then look at the eigenvalue spectrum of uh, the kernel for ResNets, and it's got this gorgeous one over, um, one over rank power law form. Um, so that was nice. Uh, so we would then expect that for the train network, we might get something similar. But in actual fact, for the train network, we have something almost shockingly different. So for our purposes, uh, it's probably easiest to start by focusing on this last, this output. And you can see here that it's nothing like the infinite network at all. Instead, there's essentially 10 big eigenvalues, and then it collapses down here to zero. And this is interesting because this is almost exactly what goes on in the output kernel. Because this is C bar 10, there are 10 classes. And that output kernel, which is the sort of one hot class labels multiplied by themselves, that's a rank 10 matrix. And so the spectra here is the spectrum at the top layer is really, really similar to the spectrum of that output kernel and completely different uh, from the infinite network case. And so there's also incidentally interesting things here going on uh, earlier layers. There's kind of a flattening of the spectrum early on here, um, but I'm not, I'm not here to talk about those, but I certainly think that's an interesting direction for future work. Okay, and so intermediate conclusion there is that this, the trained top layer network is very, very different from the infinite top layer, which potentially is sort of partly explaining this performance gap. Um, but whereas it is very similar to the output kernel, which was suggested by that linear theory. Okay, so then intermediate conclusions. <coughs> As we saw earlier, finite neural networks perform better than infinite uh, neural network Gaussian processes. And that's because neural networks, and we've now confirmed that that's because neural networks do representation learning, whereas NNGPs don't. And that overall means that to combine the benefits of Gaussian processes and neural networks, we need to somehow embed representation learning or flexibility into the sort of infinite neural network computations that we have. So that's going to be the next part of the talk on deep kernel processes. Uh, I should say, I realize it's a bit late at this point, but feel free to jump in and ask me questions. I may or may not pick things up from the chat, but you can also shout out at me. Um, yeah. Okay then.
So the outline for this section is I'm going to start by defining deep kernel processes, again, by introducing flexibility into these NNGPs. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about how the deep kernel process prior is equivalent to models we care about, such as the deep Gaussian process. Then I'm going to talk about how posterior inference should be much easier with the deep kernel process. Then I'm going to talk about our, just a tiny bit about our scalable doubly stochastic variational inducing point inference scheme, a bit of a mouthful. Um, then I'm going to show you a few results, as usual, but they'll be very brief. Okay then. So now you've probably seen this picture um, quite a few times. So this is the feature domain uh, view on here, an infinite neural network. If you remember in the kernel domain, we start with this input kernel. Then we compute uh, this ground matrix, which is the outer product of features. And then we compute the uh, kernel, which is the outer product of H's. And then we repeat that process until we get this top layer kernel. OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this feature space interpretation. Uh, so all the F's and the H's are gone. And all I have now is kernels and ground matrices in here. Then what I'm going to do is instead of taking these ground matrices to be equal to the kernel from the previous layer, I'm going to make the ground matrices sampled from some distribution over positive definite matrices that somehow centered on the kernel from the previous layer. In particular, um, we typically choose a distribution here over matrices, which is defined such that this expectation is the kernel at the previous layer. So you can sort of, in, sort of see this as adding noise around the solution from the infinite neural network. Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? Well, <clears throat> we have this uh, sort of graphical model at the top. So if we start off with a kernel that looks like this, perhaps because we've got some nice evenly spaced inputs in a squared exponential kernel. So then we're going to sample a gram matrix, which is going to be similar to this, but have some noise. And that gram matrix looks something like this. And then we're going to apply a kernel and that's going to sort of non-linearly transform this. So here, red is negative, blue is positive. And so if you think about the results of applying a squared exponential kernel, they're always positive, um, which is why this is just blue in here. And then we add noise and we apply the uh, kernel matrix or the kernel transformation again. And this is with one particular distribution over positive definite matrices, which is the Vichart. Turns out there's other distributions you can use. And a really important one is the inverse Vichart. Um, and you can see that this has the same basic intuition. The patterns of noise that it adds might be slightly different. Um, so they seem to be slightly more axis aligned maybe, but we again haven't looked at that in uh, massive amounts of depth. Okay, so that's the sort of big picture of what a deep kernel process looks like. But, you know, how do these relate back to models we know and love like the deep Gaussian process? Well, so this was our deep kernel process again. So I'm going to make a couple of changes. So I'm going to reintroduce this feature interpretation, these Fs down here. And I'm going to make a specific choice of the distribution over kernels. And I'm going to use a Vichart in here. And we're going to see why a Vichart is particularly relevant later. And then in feature space, uh, if we think about a deep Gaussian process, it turns out there's actually something that is exactly equivalent. So in particular, again, we start by taking the um, kernel as the outer product of the x's. And then we're going to sample these f's from a Gaussian with that kernel. And then we're going to compute the kernel at the next layer as a function of these features. And then we're going to put that use that kernel as the covariance of a Gaussian, and we're going to sample the next Fs from that uh, Gaussian. Then we're going to compute the kernel, and then we're going to use that kernel up um, as the kernel for the output Gaussian process. 
So now there's two really big tricks that I'm using to show these two things are equivalent. So the first is that if F is Gaussian and has this covariance down here, then actually that's equivalent to saying that this gram matrix is sampled from a Bishop. Now, as I say, we're gonna see a little bit more of that. The other really important thing is that this kernel can actually be equivalently computed on either as a function of the features F or as a function of the gram matrix G. So this isn't the case absolutely everywhere, but it is the case for most kernels that we care about. So I'll also uh, talk a little bit about why, when and why that's the case. Okay. So then that first trick that gram matrices are Vichard distributed really comes from the definition of the Vichard. So in particular, the Vichard is actually defined by taking vectors F, which are distributed as a Gaussian with some covariance matrix K. Then I stack them all together in there. And then I take their product. And that product here, which is now a positive definite matrix, is Vichard distributed. And the only sort of real difference to the deep kernel process is a normalization. So in the deep Vichard process, <clears throat> We divide this FF transpose by N and we divide to get the same thing. We divide this kernel in here by N. And that just means that the resulting gram matrix has an expectation that's equal to K down here. So that's just to keep everything normalized as it flows through the network. Okay. And then that second trick was that <clears throat> there's a certain class of kernels that can be written either as a function of the features or as a function of the gram matrix. And so if we take an isotropic kernel that depends only on uh, square distance, so something like the squared exponential kernel that looks like this, sorry for the slightly verbose um, uh, language here, but this is now the square distance computed as a function of the features. Um, so that square distance then is in there. Well, it turns out that the square distance can be computed from the gram matrix um, in this way. And so the basic idea is that you take this expression up here and you expand the brackets and then you notice that the sort of products of Fs that you get out are actually elements of the gram matrix. So you end up with sort of the diagonal elements and the relevant off diagonal terms in there. But then as soon as we can compute the square distance from the gram matrix, we can actually compute any kernel that just depends on the distance from the gram matrix. And so that would look something like this. So there are this family of kernels now that can be written as a function of the features or as a function of the gram matrix. And it's important actually that this is not actually limited to these isotropic kernels. There are other kernels which can be, which have this property, um, such as uh, the kernels that people use for infinite neural networks that relate to those ReLU nonlinearities. Okay. So that shows that the deep kernel process prior is equivalent to the deep Gaussian process prior. But then the next question is like, well, do I necessarily care? Like people have thought really hard about how to do inference in deep Gaussian processes. That's very well established. Um, do I need to do inference in this uh, radically different space of, of sort of positive definite matrices, which are kernel matrices and gram matrices? So the answer is that it actually is a big benefit to work with the kernel matrices. And that's because if we think about deep Gaussian process true posteriors, it turns out they actually have infinitely many modes, which arise from rotation symmetries in the feature space. But it turns out that this is quite hard to show graphically, so I'm not going to go into more depth on this. Um, instead, I'm going to talk about the analogous thing that happens with Bayesian neural networks. So they have multimodal posteriors, um, sort of exponentially many modes, which is at least easier to draw than infinitely many. And these arise from permutation symmetries. Um, so this is sort of swapping the order of units in the network, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. Um, but in contrast, deep kernel process posteriors are much simpler and easier to approximate. And they might even, uh, so there's none of these permutational rotation symmetries, 
and they might even be unimodal, although this is a work in progress. Okay then. So as we all know, things like a Bayesian neural network have a really complicated loss landscape that looks something like this. And certainly we think a large part of this complexity comes from these unit swapping symmetries. So if we think about this as part of a neural network now, we have these two units in here, and you can see all these weights going in and out. So here, uh, blue represents positive weights and red represents negative weights. So what I'm now gonna do is swap the order of these two units and at the same time swap the input and output weights. So I'm gonna do this. Now, importantly, this can't have changed the input-output relationship for uh, this, this component of the network. And that's because at the outputs here, I'm just adding these inputs and actually these two things are the same, they've just swapped the order. But the actual weight matrices are different. So if I go back, you can see that as I swap the elements and these ways, these change location. So then when I'm working with my variational approximate posteriors, I really need, or I should, be representing these different modes. In practice, sorry, I can't do In contrast, sort of, this is entirely not a problem in the deep kernel process world, and that is because, sort of, these sim these per these symmetries all arise out of permutations or rotations in the feature space, and in fact, unitary permutations or rotations in the feature space. So now, if I define then a uh, transformed set of features f prime. I can ask, well, what happens to the ground matrix or the kernel matrix? And it turns out that absolutely nothing happens. So if you define then this sort of transformed ground matrix as being the transformed features multiplied by themselves, then, you know, this UU transposed pops out, disappears, and I get back to the original ground matrix. And so that means that these uh, symmetries, the permutation symmetries in the case of the neural network or rotation symmetries in the case of the deep Gaussian process, they give you a really complicated posterior over weights or over features. That's, those symmetries are simply irrelevant in the case of uh, ground matrices, and you can even get uh, unimodal posteriors. So we actually strongly believe that these posteriors are unimodal, um, at least in the linear case. Um, whereas if you think about a deep Gaussian process or a deep neural network, uh, even in a linear case, there are, the posteriors are not unimodal. Okay. So then I've sort of defined this uh, deep kernel process. We've seen that it's probably going to be useful, but how do we actually do inference uh, in these settings? Well, the answer, uh, as usual, is variational inference. And we can define a process relative to what goes on in a deep Gaussian process. Um, so there is, it should be said, deep Vichart processes, which is work that's currently led by SEB, which is going to be a submission for NeurIPS this year. Um, I'm going to talk about a deep inverse Vichart process because that's what we did in the first paper because it's slightly easier to work with. And so the generative model is going to look something like this. So the gram matrix at the first layer is an inverse Vichart distribution uh, taking the inputs as the kernel. And then we do multiple steps um, of taking an inverse Bichart with some, again, nonlinear transformation, perhaps corresponding to a, a squared exponential kernel of the ground matrix at the previous layer. And then we've got something at the top layer out here that resembles a Gaussian process. So we're taking the features now uh, to be Gaussian depending on that top layer kernel. 
And then the approximate posterior can be very simple. So it can really just be an inverse Vichart distribution over this G1 here, um, where we now have some learned parameters in place of what's propagating here from the previous layers. And we can do that now for across all these layers. And so this is now, I mean, potentially this looks quite complicated, but actually I think it's relatively simple if you compare it to a deep Gaussian process where there's an awful lot of choices to make and an awful lot of complexity um, in how you go about defining these approximate posteriors. Okay. And there's another really neat thing going on here, which is that as one of these parameters here, delta, goes to infinity, then actually this prior down here becomes deterministic and you end up back at a neural network Gaussian process. And that's now really nice because it means that we've got a, a model that sort of captures that infinite neural network as a limit and so sort of has to be doing better than that or at least equivalent to that in practice when we actually train it. Okay. So we define then, that's the approximate posterior. We define a scalable doubly stochastic inducing point inference scheme for these things, again, mirroring those in the, in the Gaussian process domain. And importantly, the complexity of these things is very similar again to what happens in the, in the sparse Gaussian process domain. So if we take N to be the number of training points, M to be the number of inducing points, and D to be the number of, of deep Gaussian process features, then deep Gaussian processes have this scaling. Um, so usually actually it's going to be uh, the number of features times here, the inducing points cubed uh, times uh, M squared N. Sometimes uh, you can get slightly less accuracy uh, by treating these features, by sort of sharing covariances for these features, in which case you can get this scaling down here. So inverse Bichat processes, they don't actually have in any meaningful sense, a number of features in here. So there's actually no way that computation can scale with D in here. And we end up with just um, the same scaling, both with inducing points and with training data points as you got in the underlying sort of deep Gaussian process or sparse Gaussian process case, which is very encouraging because it means that this should be at least reasonably scalable compared to past methods. Okay. And so then obligatory slide of results with some numbers that show we do better because you know our column is in bold. Um, some interesting points about this are that the benefits that we see, certainly for the smaller data sets like Boston and Concrete, are potentially really big. And some of those benefits are really big for uh, if we look at the elbow as opposed to just the test log likelihood. And the elbow is potentially important because it captures sort of how well we're doing at approximating the posterior. And it's also important for bounding the generalization error if you think about something like pack phase. So the other important thing here is that we have, we've looked at an NNGP, so an infinite neural network in here. And uh, sort of as expected, we see that we're almost always uh, doing better than the NNGP. The NNGP is quite good here, uh, except for this very small number of cases where uh, the difference is, again, very small. And we expect that's because of optimization issues rather than anything, anything more serious. OK, then. So in conclusion, um, I've shown you that deep kernel processes have these flexible learned representations as you get in the finite neural networks, um, but they have uncertainty estimation properties that look very similar to those in Gaussian processes. And hopefully um, they have simple and perhaps even unimodal posteriors that are going to be very easy to uh, approximate. And DK, deep kernel processes, I haven't shown you in this talk, but it's in the paper. They include a huge number of models that we really care about, such as these finite neural networks, um, infinite neural networks with bottlenecks, uh, inf just infinite neural networks on neural network Gaussian processes and deep Gaussian processes. And with this deep inverse Bichat process, I showed you a scalable doubly stochastic inducing point variational inference scheme, bit of a mouthful, mouthful again, 
and superior performance on these uh, relatively simplistic tasks. And one of our big challenges is scaling these up to, to convolutional networks at the moment. Okay, so then to my mind, this is a really exciting direction for future work and there's a lot of open directions. So I'll give you now a bit of an overview of what I see for some of these directions. So there's a lot of domains where uh, deep kernel processes or deep inverse Fischer processes are appropriate, potentially beneficial. So this is actually anywhere where you currently use a deep Gaussian process. Um, in a domain like reinforcement learning, where often you're using a lot of relatively small-ish neural networks. I mean, even in Atari, you're talking a sort of three or four layer networks. And then there are other domains where approximating the posterior well is really important, such as in a variation of continual learning. And then, as I said, Seb, uh, Sebastian Aubert was leading this work on deep Vichart processes. And I think these are really important because with a deep Vichart process, there's this feature-based interpretation that might allow us to do efficient random feature approximations and eventually get onto uh, to convolutional networks. And another really interesting direction that I think about sometimes is that um, stochastic gradient descent can actually be quite slow say it quietly. Um, and now that we've got this deep kernel process model uh, that's actually relatively simple as a strong word, but I think it's not invalid in this case, relatively simple and uniform, there's a possibility of reaching back into some of the more classical Bayesian literature to find other methods of doing inference in these setups. So things like a natural gradient or an expectation propagation method might give us kind of an iterative approach that conver can converge in like 10 steps instead of like 10,000 steps, um, which would be really exciting. And then finally, there's implementations of all of these things uh, at this repo here, and we are keeping this up to date because it's forming the basis of, of our future work as well. Okay, thanks, and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you.